you kind of the product side. Yeah. Now, what I'm going to talk to you today about is really IoT, as the title said, but also a couple of things specifically. So, the IOX framework that we're working on as it relates to fog and fog computing, as well as a technology called Data in Motion. Now, the reason I'm doing this is we actually do have a hackathon that starts tomorrow. If you haven't signed up, you want to come play with the technology, really get to know it in depth. Come over tomorrow, we've got a 24-hour hackathon that you should really participate in, and I'll shamelessly promote this again at the end, okay? So, Internet of Things. One well, of the interesting things is in about 2009, we actually crossed this interesting inflection point. It's the inflection point when there were more things than there were human beings on the planet. Now, most people don't realize that this happened several years ago, right? And when you look at the trend out in about 2020, there'll actually be 50 billion smart objects out in the world, okay? So we have teams of really smart people inside the company looking at this problem and saying, you know, what does that really mean for us, right? Where should we be investing in technology? Because a lot of times when you look at this technology, people think about wearables, right? Everybody and their brother has a Fitbit these days. You see, you know, all of these crazy gadgets. If you go to CES like I do, you see all these crazy gadgets that you can attach to or something. But that's not it. Really, the enterprise and kind of industrial application of the Internet of Things is really where we begin to see the technology evolving. Now, why is that? Because when you look at the amount of data that's created, okay, you think about smart meters. A little over a billion data points every single day is created. And then you think about kind of a contemporary point, flights, flight data recorders. About 10 terabytes of data is, cr is created for every 30 minutes of flights. Now you aggregate that up in terms of the number of flights there are every day, it's more than a petabyte every day. So you really sum this data up and you end up with this huge data aggregation problem. Right? Somewhere on the order of two exabytes of data is created every single day. Right? Now, what you need to understand is when you look at that data, it's not all useful. So the other problem that we look at is, how do you actually take kind of this torrent of data, right, that's being generated out at the edge? You can think of things like temperature sensors that are spitting out readings, and they stay the same 99% of the time. They're just spitting out information. Hey, I'm 40C, I'm 40C, I'm 40C, and it's really not that interesting. But when you start to see fluctuations in that data, right? There's patterns hidden inside the data. So I always say, these for all the techie people in the world, when you have kind of this high or low signal to noise ratio, that's where you really begin to see a lot of power in what we're doing. Okay? Turning that data into information, which ultimately gets transported up to high density compute in the cloud and other locations to make it knowledge and then a feedback loop really making that wisdom. You can do a lot of power, and the challenge would be without instituting kind of a new way of looking at this data and the data flows, you might not even go after some of the applications that we can see now, right? Because the problem of transporting the data set is so large, you might say, yeah, I know there's information in there somewhere, but I can't get at it. I see the bill. I see what this bandwidth is going to cost me on a daily basis to get at it. It's not worth it, right? This concept of transporting everything up to the cloud, when you start looking in the future, it just doesn't make sense. We also see a paradigm shift coming, okay? You look at it today, and what do people think about? They think about these endpoints, right? They'll send everything up to the cloud, we'll store it in the cloud, we'll then analyze it, we'll maybe take some action on it, and then we'll notify people of what's happened. But this is just between an input and the cloud. We see a new paradigm coming where you really move some of this analyze, and some of this notify, and actually distributed actions out at the edge, as close as possible to the sources of data. This is back to that optimization that I was talking about. That whole sequence in the cloud still occurs. I don't want people to misunderstand that what we're suggesting is that goes away. That's absolutely not it. You see the investments we're making across the company. You'll see it here all over the place inside Cisco Live. But it's just another layer of intelligence that we're putting out near the edge, okay? So again, you talk to a lot of traditional IT people these days and what they'll see is these small endpoints distributed out there in the cloud and almost nothing in between, right? There's just infrastructure, right? But because of this data deluge that I was talking about before, we see this additional layer called FOG that begins to be inserted. Now I get the question all the time, what does the acronym FOG stand for? 
I'm going to tell you right now, it's not an acronym. It doesn't stand for anything. It literally is a reference to being closer to the end, closer to the edge, closer to the ground, if you will, than what we would talk about for fog, right? So that transition in this data model is really pretty powerful. Now, the first instantiation that you will see from us around fog is called IOX, okay? Now, this is what I do on a daily basis. So what does IOX mean? IOX is all about taking communications, so our edge routing platforms, our hardened platforms that you've got out there for IoT, combining it with what we refer to as open source, an open platform for you to be able to put your own applications actually out at the edge. This is basically what we refer to as IOX, and I'll have another chart in a second. But the power that this brings in, because of the way we're combining it, there's two new concepts. Bring your own interface and bring your own application. So let's start with bring your own application. This is usually the easiest for people to kind of get their head around. That means we're going to provide you an environment where we believe there's often going to be times you know what should be out there closest to the edge more than we do. So we're going to provide this environment for you to load your operating system out there or to take a path style application and really load it out near the edge and take simple actions. Now we're not saying you're going to do advanced analytics out near the edge on this little endpoint, right? Not a ton of compute out there, not a ton of storage. But there are applications out there that make a lot of sense to distribute in this manner. Now the second piece of this, bring your own interface. When we looked at the industrial, industrial ethernet, right? You look at manufacturing, years and years and years of technology built up there with interfaces that we may never build ourselves as Cisco, right? So there's a couple ways we could have gone with this. And I've seen us do both in the past. I've been at Cisco about coming up on 14 years. We could have said, look, we'll wait for marquee customers to come to us, the biggest of the big, and say, this is an interface we care about. We'll build a business case around it, then we'll build technology to integrate with it, we'll do our whole cycle of uh, development on top of it, and then it'll be one. But the problem is in this space, there are so many of these interfaces, and they're not all going to come from the biggest of the big. So what we said is, we're going to provide a way, an environment, where you can actually integrate your own drivers. Right? If you saw any of the announcements we've done around this, we've got specific technology examples bringing in, for instance, a USB uh, access point, a different wireless technology than we've integrated into the platform. It took about four hours for somebody to integrate their proprietary wireless technology into our platform. Okay? This can be huge. Now you think about the application of this, getting technologies that were once proprietary directly integrated into the network element and taking actions out there without having to deploy additional servers, additional equipment out of the edge, this can be very, very powerful. Okay? Now, in total, what does IOX really mean? We look at it more than just iOS, just this environment. We actually look at it as a bundle of technologies because, let's be honest, the devices that we're targeting, and I'll show you what the portfolio is here in a minute, they're small, they're made for the edge, they're hardened. Okay? These are things that you're going to see on poles and energy, inside vehicles for transportation, 3G, 4G connected devices. Okay? So we actually think in that type of environment, you have to deal with the manageability up front. You know, managing it as a unit of one and then counting on all of you to write 100 Perl scripts that are going to go out and FTP something down into it, it's just not going to work, right? So this is really a system. This is a system that's coming out with management attached to enable you to address it in terms of thousands of units, not in terms of individual units. And that's a critical component of it, right? And we're really going to open all of these APIs up to you so that you can integrate either your application directly on top of it, directly into it, or just work with it alongside it. Now data in motion. So inside of this IOX framework, we actually see the opportunity for a lot of services. And this is what we're going to continue to do is build out these gateway services over time. Data in motion is an example of kind of an acquisition turned into a product, turned into a service inside IOX. Now what's the core of it? Looking at that paradigm, it really provides you with this policy engine, this ability to define rules, okay? and set them out into these elements. So get it close to the edge. Get it inside that aggregation in a multi-layer policy, and then begin to analyze data where you've got a lot of data out at the edge, and then in each layer of the network, you're actually able to filter the data further down to get to that point where you're achieving that ultimate wisdom. 
So the portfolio, it's interesting to note there's a lot of verticals that we are specifically looking at as an Internet of Things group, spanning manufacturing, mining, energy, oil and gas, all the way over into defense. And that's a lot based on the portfolio that we have here, which includes things like the IE2000, 3000 switches focused on manufacturing, really hardened switches, right? So IP66, IP67 type switches, okay? The plant switching portfolio, the plant routing portfolio, a lot of the connected grids. If you follow what we've done in energy, we've got connected grid platforms out there as well. We also have embedded systems. So a lot of application of this technology inside of the military, you think wearables, yes, we do have some wearable technology that we use uh, for defense, and then ultimately physical security as well. Now I often get people that scratch their head and they say, physical security, how does this kind of fit into the Internet of Things? Well, the reality is, if you think about it, the camera is one of the most powerful sensors that you've got on the planet, right? It has audio. It can see everything. But it's honestly one of the most underutilized type of sensors out there, right? I'm biased, but this is one of the things that we're looking at here. Now, we wrap all this up with network management that we provide, security applications, this fog environment with IOX, and then obviously, technologies from the data center and virtualization team. Now, what I'm going to do next is walk through just a couple examples to make this a little less abstract, a little more real in terms of what we see, because this is what I always get. And we can talk about this, but until you see examples of how it would actually be used and kind of the power of the technology, it doesn't become real. Okay? So we think about rail systems. Okay? There's a lot of initiatives around rail right now, and really what's driving it. Fear of derailment, okay? also underutilization of equipment. But then at the end, we look at this and say, well, I haven't talked about this yet. One of the interesting things about IoT is we find targeted use cases within customers, okay? something that's a real problem that they see today that they want to go solve. For instance, they want to address fear of derailment in this particular case. How can we monitor equipment? How can we make sure the equipment is in the best possible state? But then as a result of the infrastructure that we put in place, we see other use cases get addressed immediately. Okay? So in this particular case, putting in technology inside this platform to begin monitoring bearings, right? So monitoring vibration, monitoring heat inside bearings in the system, what does this mean? It means we can get real-time analysis showing us, hey, you actually need to maintain that device now, that train. It needs maintenance now. We know your maintenance schedule said that you weren't going to do anything for another six months, but you actually have a problem right now. Okay? But as a result of what we put on board there, we actually now have the ability to say, hey, you've got 3G, 4G connectivity out, you can begin turning on amenities like Wi-Fi, hotspots on the trains, all kind of combined together in one use case. I'm just going to do one more here. Oil pipelines. And this is, I don't know if anybody's driven out or flown out or walked out to where the oil pipelines are. Out in the middle of nowhere, it's where no one really wants to go. People don't get out there to maintain them for years at a time often. Okay? So what's the problem? There's really not great system to do leak detection, and we all care about that, right? I think we can all agree on that. There's actually limited network connectivity out there, and it's really costly to send anybody out to maintain anything. And so, as we discuss this technology with our partners in oil and gas, what they see this is, look, we can do local monitoring of pressure along the pipeline. Okay? What this gives us an opportunity to do is then actually actuate switches and pumps out in the field. So that means, look, I can send you a warning. I know that the pressure's gone down. I know that there's a leak out there. We're going to send a warning out. It's not horrible right now. But then if it drops even further, we can actually turn off that section of the pipe okay, and avert what could be an ultimate disaster. Right? All of this without having to send somebody rapidly out into the field immediately. Right? It buys you a little bit of time to get somebody out into the field. So just to kind of sum up some of this, when we look at IOX and kind of IoT and fog computing all together, where do we really see it going? We really see it combining kind of the best of internetworking, we're biased there, iOS, along with the best of open source, bringing your own operating system, bringing your own application. Okay? We're putting in place tools to simplify this app deployment, in fact, even working with the APEC, which you saw earlier. What we hope, we have a certain view. Right? And everybody's always limited by their own view, but by opening up this environment, that we really enable the innovation of others. 
right? By providing a platform and others will teach us, look, these are things you haven't thought about, but you provided me this environment, therefore we can enable this out on the edge now. And ultimately, it's a new opportunity for the ISPEs and kind of application developers that hopefully are in the crowd today and are gonna participate in the hackathon tomorrow. So, I've talked about the hackathon quite a bit. What does it mean? So literally, if you weren't on the meetup that we had last week, you should participate in the hackathon. We're coming with a bucket of sensors, vibration sensors, temperature sensors, pressure sensors, Arduinos, fidgets, etc. We're coming with a platform. If you haven't seen our train, go look at the train that's going on right now, right about there, as you walk out towards the escalator. And IDEs, right? So we've got integration with Eclipse, we've got Linux environments, etc. Come do something interesting and amazing. We're trying to put in place just an open environment for people to come, work with the technology in terms of IOX to interface with different interfaces, data in motion to integrate with policy engines, etc. To really create something interesting. Now I'm going to stop. Now I flew through that. So does anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Just say it, I'll repeat it. So, so the question is basically, when you say opening it up, what does that really mean? Does it mean I can just run a VM in there? Does it mean I can run my binary in there? Are you going to allow me to run past style applications? The reality is the answer is all of the above. Okay? So when we look at this, there, there's a couple different scenarios we look at. Okay? Number one is where you've built up your own environment. You have your own operating system. You're tied into it. You really don't, at least today, want to make the investment in moving to a new technology. Right? This is like a brownfield opportunity. You're going to try this out with a couple customers. We didn't want to get in your way for that, so we provided an environment that's truly you're able to just virtualize it. Okay? The second one is we will be providing a pass style environment with you know Python and Java, etc., for you to be able to distribute your applications out that way if that's what you have, or if you're looking at actually changing the architecture. For, so, for instance, I have one customer right now. The, the CTO laughed. He said, "Look, when we were building out this application, I knew that we shouldn't build it the way we did." I knew we shouldn't just build the cloud, right? We just, that's the way we did it. We built everything in the cloud. I knew eventually we would have to distribute it. So now we're at that point. Which technology can I use and actually, as I start to decompose this application and send intelligence out to the edge, which technology can I use? We went down through the list. So you can either do VM, well, I don't see a reason to do that. So I haven't built it that way right now. I'd rather use Java. Fantastic. We're going to have an environment for you to do that. So we're really, pretty flexible about which way we're going to go, and those are the, the kind of two or three examples that we work off of. Any other questions? All right. Oh. Uh, challenges with analog to digital, right? Age old question. I don't know that that's a question for IOX, but really when we look at that, when we look at analog to digital, there's obviously analog to digital gateways out there that'll turn it into something IP-ish that can come in, and this is what we see, whether they're USB attached, whether they're serial attached, et cetera. So, so that basically ends up being an interface between the analog and between this environment. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, if you have any other questions, please let me know, I'll be around.